Okay, today we're going to talk about the art of the Islamic world. We're mostly focusing on everywhere from Spain through to the Middle East, Northern Africa, and a little bit of India. Even though in the Quran it doesn't necessarily say you should, you cannot have figurative representation in, in religious art, the art of Islam stays away from all figurative representation because they wish to stay away from the idea of worshiping a graven image, an idol. Okay, that's called, they're an iconoclast, or what we call anaconic, all right? And there's no, the Quran doesn't necessarily mandate against figurative representation in art, but they just want to stay away from idolatry and worship of images, okay? So to create their artwork and to make it more beautiful and, be and beautify their spaces and their, and their uh, buildings and mosques and palaces, they use pattern. And pattern's got a, not only a decorative thing, an element to it, but it's also meant to be meditative. And in some cases, it's meant to be symbolic as well. There were four sources of Islamic pattern. One is geometric, or in other words, geometry or math, circles, squares, things like that. Vegetation, vegetal, like plants, okay, flowers and plants. And they all, vegetation also comes with a lot of symbolic meaning, like the cypress tree it means humility towards God. Calligraphic, in their writing, they use it decoratively as well as a meditative, spiritual inspiration. And then in the secular or everyday art, you'll find figurative or animal patterning as well used. Dome of the Rock, which has been both, a, it started out as a mosque and then became a church and then it was a palace and now it's a mosque again. You'll notice that in the exterior and the interior, we have heavy patterning, okay? And we also still have some Christian symbols inside of it. You'll find some of the Christian icons and things, but this is still, a, this is now a mosque. You'll notice at the very top of the dome there, we have not only, we've got the calligraphy as part of the decorative and meditative element. This is a basic floor plan of a, of a mosque, and this is used worldwide. There are variations, of course. When you enter the mosque usually you wash at a fountain or a, a, a small lake or whatever it is you know, you know there'd be some sort of water feature there but it's meant to be clean when you go to prayer okay and you enter it also through a hypo style hall a hypo style means a hall it is simply a hall that's covered with a lot of columns in the interior of it and this floor plan all those dots that you see those are all columns it's meant to have sort of a mesmerizing effect. When you go in to pray, you pray towards the mihrab, which is in just a niche in the wall. And it points the direction towards Mecca because you must, pay, you must pray towards Mecca. The minbar is a pulpit and the minaret is the towers that, that where the people stand and, the, and call to prayer. The call to prayer comes from there. The mascara is a usually a somewhat screened area that is meant to be the seating for just the ruler or the king or the pasha or the aga or whatever it is for that area. The ruler sits there. That's his special place. It's meant to show status and power. And of course, it's close to not only the minbar, the pulpit, but also the mihrab. This is the aerial view. You can kind of recognize that area of the, of the great mosque in Cordoba, Spain. Spain was governed by the Moors, which were, were Islam, for, oh gosh, almost a millennia. 900 years or something? Yeah, uh, or more. So this originally was a mosque, now it's a church. <laughs> the interior, here's the interior of Cordoba. And you'll notice this is a hypostyle hall with the double archways, okay? It's meant to be as you walk in with all that patterning and the halls, the columns themselves, it's meant to be mesmerizing. It's meant to make you put you in a meditative state. 
like a forest of trees. This is the Mascura in the Great Mosque, okay, in Cordoba. And the that small archway in the center would have been where the, the ruler would have sit, the king would have sat or whatever. And you'll notice those are double corbelled archways. They've got the super arch inside the arch on top of the arch, okay? You notice this, they've got kind of a fluted sort of look to those arches, those double corbelled, okay? This is the Imam Mosque in Iran, and you'll notice the exterior is coated covered in tile work that is all based on pattern. And the interior, here's no portal. Notice the patterning here. This is just the entryway. It's meant to be dazzling and overwhelming. Okay. Here's a close up. Notice this is Notice the plants that are referenced here and repeated over and over again. That's using vegetation as a pattern source. And notice the circles and there's diamonds and it's based sort of on a geometric floor, you know, kind of layout. That's using that using plants and geometry to create this pattern. Okay. And of course, this patterning shows up in other forms of architecture like this <coughs> palace here and Granada called the Alhambra, which is uh, Arabic for the red. Since it's got so much red stone in this building. Um, this is the courtyard and inside of it, you see the little fountain. I think that references not only the cleanliness or fountain aspect of this sort of palace, but also it's something that you'll find in a lot of palaces in the Middle East and in is that since water is so scarce, it's rather sort of nice to have this sort of water feature in your own home. Status, beauty, tranquility, all of those things. This is a mausoleum or a, a burial tomb, a tomb um, in India. And not only is this the main tomb air building that houses the, let's see, Shah Jahan and Moon, that's the that's what the the, the Aga the, the king okay, and Mumtaz Mahal his favorite wife she died first and he was so torn up about it he created this entire thing in, in her memory and her honor to bury her and he was he joined her later of course when he died, um, but not only is the building itself sort of geometrically based and decorated interior and exterior, but also the entire grounds, the gardens and all the outbuildings, the supportive buildings that are part of this huge complex are based on a geometric sort of pattern and layout on purpose. This is called what we call secular art. The art of the everyday, you know, like everyday objects, okay, rather than something religiously based, okay. This is a simply a decorative box made of ivory, so it would have been very costly to have made. And you just open it up where the clasp is and you put things in it. But you'll notice here the representation of both people and animals used in a pattern sort of way. We've got this sort of symmetrical balance here in this middle, but that's using animals. It's okay in this type of artwork in the art of the Islamic world. And since Christians and Muslims traded and had commerce, they weren't always warring with each other. There was lots of exchange of ideas and goods and services, and they learned from each other and they borrowed from each other in both their, their knowledge of the world, but also in their beautiful objects and their way they're represented. This piece was actually used in a Catholic church as a baptistry, even though it was made in the Middle East. You even see the calligraphy underneath the lip there. It's made with a, this type of technique of this, of this metal work is called a marriage of metals. It's like when you inlay pieces of different colored metals and you solder or glue them down using heat. 
and then you create your look of your designs or here quite obviously a figurative sort of thing going on here. This was used in a cathedral. Now we're talking about calligraphy. Calligraphy, if you're a calligrapher in the Muslim, for, for Islamic war, in the Islamic world, okay, you must usually learn from a master and it, you're gonna become an apprentice and it takes decades to learn how to do this. You not only learn the techniques and different types of calligraphy, there are several different styles, but you also must learn how to create your own inks and your own papers and your own reeds or brushes that you use to create the look of the work. This is all, calligraphy is used as a decorative, as a beautiful thing, but also as a meditative thing. You're actually meant to read it, but the word of God must be beautiful as well. And that's why there's, calligraphy is so important in the Islamic world. The words themselves are holy, and therefore the script should be holy too, I think. This is a folio, a book of just different types of styles of calligraphy, different types of uh, verse, things from the Quran, okay? And this would have been prized. It's a decorative element, but it's also meant to be a prayerful type of. Notice, notice here in these everyday dishware, calligraphy shows up again as part of the patterning around the outside of the edge. I like that idea of praying before a meal or you know, giving thanks to a meal. Here it's literally represented on the plate. Also in secular art, you'll see this type of thing. This is a sort of an illustration. It's art, part of a book. And you'll notice that when you look at it in Western eyes, you're thinking, gee, the, this is the interior of a home. It certainly looks odd. That's because it's done mostly, but not completely, in isometric perspective, because it's telling a story of how Yusuf is escaping the clutches of this temptress. And she's not pushing him off the, the, the floor here. She, the, the lady here in red is kind of grabbing for him, but he's escaping. He's not leaping for it. You know, he's not, you know, killing himself or anything. He's not leaping out of the picture. He's basically running to escape this. He's got to go through seven locked doors. Okay, she's got him that far into the building and locked the doors behind him and now he's gonna escape and he makes it. But notice that the space doesn't make any sense. This is not a true, what we would call Western real, realistic representation of the interior of a home. It does not make sense spatially, but it's not supposed to in Islamic art. Here it's all about the story and the beauty of the image and what it represents. They knew about linear perspective they just chose not to use it. And this is a, another painting. Notice the figures. It's uh, it's the king of the first king of Iran or Persia, Gayumars, the court of Gayumars. There he is seated, hierarchical scale. He's the largest figure right in the center, and to his left is his son, and to his right is his grandson, and there is his courtiers. This king was meant to have brought farming. To this area okay and he's actually supposed to have had built its first palace in the mountaintops and i think that's why they referenced him here holding court in the mountaintops but it's not what we call in western eyes a realistic representation it's meant to be more magical and more beautiful 